It's Monday, and you know what that means, OG? Time to say thank you for the weekend. What a great way to start our week, saying a big shout out, thank you to the men and women in our armed forces. On behalf of the Stacking Benjamins family and our friends at Navy Federal, that family, a huge Monday thank you for your service to the USA. Let's all go stack some Benjamins together, peeps. Hi, I'm Mitchell Walker, and when I'm not teaching people how to find hidden money, I'm out stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, we're talking trailblazing. You know, speaking of trailblazing, don't you ever wonder what podcasting would have been like back before the West was won? Well, howdy there, partner. Here from the steps of this here stack in Benjamin's General Store comes a show about trailblazers. Here to share stories of the women who blazed the path for national public radio clear across this country, we welcome Lisa Napoli. Plus, ever think about buying your next doodad with one of them newfangled layaway plans like a, a, a firm or afterpay or, uh, or that there uh, Klarma? Well, we'll chat up how those work for you or, or against you, I suppose, in today's headline segment. And later, we'll wrangle up a Haven Lifeline call from Stephen about his HSA. Spend the money now or invest it for later. And of course, I'll save this here show like I usually do with some of my gold and horseshoe trivia. Now, you go get along, little doggies. And now, two guys who think buffalo chips go great with a little dip. <laughs> I won't tell them if you won't. It's Joe and uh, that there uh, OG feller. They don't go with dip. They go with ranch, ranch dressing. Ketchup, maybe. Some people use ketchup with their chips. It is yummy. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Party Foods for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And on today's Western theme show, we're talking trailblazing. Now that uh, you and I have been in Texas a little while, OG, you like how I just got back and now all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a native. It's okay. There's a good chance that you'll eventually spend more time here than, than anywhere else. But uh, at some point, a crossover yeah, point. Could, I mean, it'll be like you're in your 104, but. Easy. I'm, I'm standing right here. We got a great show, though. Speaking of trailblazers, Lisa Napoli wrote a fantastic book about the four women who were the trailblazers at National Public Radio. Uh, Some of the first women in news radio were at uh, National Public Radio. And if we're number one, talking about the workplace and better work on this show, and also we talk about mentorship, hard to get there when you don't have mentorship that looks like you or sounds like you, but these women did it anyway and really changed the face of radio. So we're going to talk to Lisa about lessons we can learn there. And we got headlines. It's like, OG, a cornucopia of goodness. You know how you just get done bringing in the harvest and now you got just foods of plentiful. That's what Monday's like on the Stacking Benjamin show. The horn of plenty. Absolutely. Do you remember coloring those when you're in elementary school around Thanksgiving? You know, it it meant there was a four day weekend coming. Five day weekend. I don't know what kind of school you went to. We got Thanksgiving off at my school. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's four days. How many days you want? Whatever. I can see what kind of school you went to. Math, <laughs> One, not two, a priority four, there. five, ch- six. <laughs> Look, Ma. Me count good. <laughs> Speaking of Thanksgiving, one of our headlines has a lot to do with Black Friday. So let's get this party started. Our first piece comes to us from the Wall Street Journal productivity tips for procrastinators. I was going to do this one as a first headline, but I thought we'd put it off and do it as a second headline. (laughs) See what you did there. (laughs) Yes. The pandemic and working from home has sapped motivation at work for many. Here are some ways to tackle a growing to-do list. 
I don't know about you. This, by the way, is written by Rachel Feinzig. I don't know about you, but I go through these spurts. I go through these huge productive spurts. And then I have these times when I, I'm just crawling. And I feel like that right now. Like I am just crawling to get anything done. I got to will myself to get stuff done this last week. Yeah. Just the pile of stuff gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is if you can focus on the one, two, or three key things that have to get done every day. If you get those things done, you're good. She writes that the pandemic has brought us to peak procrastination. Turns out your office, in addition to being in plain sight of your boss, came with environmental cues that reminded you that you had to, you know, work. Without the hum of the industrial printer and the sight of colleagues marching off to the conference room, we all tend toward aimlessness. Her tips, by the way, I love yours. Her, her number one is to get going. ADD coach Nikki Kinzer. And I find often that's, that's what I've got to do. She says to start small, focus yourself to take a first step, no matter how tiny, you, you know, it was a, was an interesting thing I was reading yesterday. Like instead of trying to run five miles, just put on your shoes and tell yourself you're going to walk a hundred yards. And if you have your shoes on and you walk a hundred yards, you're going to go further. Just tell yourself you're just going to go walk 100 yards a day in these running shoes. I wonder how this uh, correlates to some of the other stuff that we're reading about. People working from home are actually more productive. Maybe they're just more productive at non-important things. Is that maybe? I don't know. I find it, for me, it goes in, in waves. And I've been working from, you know, the basement here for a long time, yeah, for long time. A, a lot of years. But still, it just goes in waves. I actually find the opposite is true for me, not starting. Well, when it comes to working out, yes. If I just put on my workout clothes and I get my ass to wherever I'm going to work out, that's the hard part. Actually doing the workout once I'm there, not hard. Not, mm -hmm. I mean, it can be hard, but if I'm there, I enjoy it. But getting me to that point to actually get ready to do it, it doesn't happen. Same thing with working. If I've got this huge task, that's a monster in my head I don't like starting small. I actually do the exact opposite. When I'm cranking, I will do that thing first. And that's a huge breakthrough, huge breakthrough. Just get it done first thing in the morning when I have a bunch of energy. That was advice from Laura Vanderkam, who right. has studied lots of these experts that talk about this stuff. And I like that. But on a day when you can't move, maybe starting small is a, is a great way to do it instead of looking at that big, huge you know, thing that you've got that you just don't want to handle. Our friend uh, Dan Sullivan says that a mess is an obligation minus a commitment. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, you could say that with procrastination too, I guess a little bit. Well, that's interesting too, because another thing on here is just to go clean something. Yeah. If you just make your bed or you clean up a mess, it gets your brain moving, just gets you into, gets you out of the lethargic mode and into action mode. Yeah. I don't think that he means mess as like, like a literal mess, but you know, yeah. if you've got a big pile of, I don't know how it is at your house, but, uh, you know, you got like the junk drawer and the junk drawer just now it takes up two drawers <laughs> and then it takes up the entire like little desk area in the kitchen. That's like the junk table. And then it's the junk room. Yeah. yeah. It's just, that's just a big mess. And you have an obligation there to take care of it, but you're not really committed to doing it. So you have to change one of those things. You have to get rid of the obligation or increase the commitment level. Next on Nikki Kinzer's list is to get a partner. Accountability is crucial. One of Ms. Kinzer's clients meets with a peer every morning. They plan their weeks, talk about priorities, and touch base at the end of each day to review how things went. I have a coach that uh, three Mondays a month I meet with yeah. for 45 minutes, and we go over what I'm going to do that week. It doesn't all get done, but I will tell you that I want to make sure that I got my ducks in a row when I meet with Mary Lou. And the accountability, if you don't have that person, you can be accountable to yourself. You know, there's thousands of productivity journals out there. Michael Hyatt's one's pretty good. And, and there's hundreds of other ones. But the big thing is, put down, here are the things that need to get done. You know, sometimes just clearing that from the, the clutter of your mind, so to speak, puts you in the framework of like, oh, I can knock these things out. You know, give yourself one thing to do. Speaking of getting away from the clutter, add some separation, she writes. Don't prove social media in the same room where you work. If possible, take breaks in a separate space and use a different device. Even just placing your phone a 20-second walk away can help. 
so that you won't do that. I, I actually had to do that. I had to separate the computer that I use for work from the Xbox that I use to play games. And I also had to set boundaries on when I play games and when I don't. I remember walking into a guy's office in the middle of the day uh, when I was a financial planner and he was playing solitaire on his computer. And I thought, why would I be sitting in my office at two o'clock in a random afternoon, just playing solitaire in my office when I could either find a new client, help out my current client, do something to get stuff done. Go home. Yeah. And then play all the solitaire that I want at home someplace comfortable. So for him, even the separation made it difficult, but you got to set some boundaries. Last, which is her next one, establish a routine, set firm work hours, start at nine, even if the boss isn't watching. I think at home, that's a hard thing, OG, is that instead of going home at five o'clock and having that separation, well, now we're already at home. So for a lot of people, it's difficult to turn it off then, which ultimately leads to burnout, which leads to then more procrastination. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the hardest thing people have experienced, I think, over the last year and some changes, turning it off, closing the laptop at a specific time or or shutting the bedroom door that you're working from at a certain time and, and not going back in. You know, you don't run back to the office generally at eight o'clock at night because you forgot something. You just go, well, get that tomorrow. Do the same thing at home. Yeah. Uh, last one Rachel has here is Don't beat yourself up too much. It's a pandemic and uh, have a little empathy for yourself. OG. Hey, you know what it is because it's Monday. It is the TikTok minute. Every Monday we bring you a new TikTok video from a creator who is uh, sharing some wisdom. And in most cases, you'll find that we're using the word wisdom in, in air quotes. And today, today we're going to talk about safe moon, a new cryptocurrency called safe moon which is trading right now for not even a penny or a tenth of a penny or a hundredth of a penny or a thousandth of a penny but what what's the next one a ten thousandth of a penny it's trading for one ten thousandth of a penny that's what it's worth all you gotta do is some math og all right you guys so this is safe moon Safe Moon, check it out. Look at this current price right now. All right, so let's say you invest only like $30. So you take that $30 times the current value of this coin right now, and you get about roughly 19 million coins. So let's say this thing goes up to about just one cent. Your potential almost $200,000. 200000 it goes up to a cent. Safe Moon finds its way from one ten thousandth of a cent to one penny on 30 bucks. Bada boom, bada bang. That's all you got to do. Two things got to happen. But you got to do your part first, OG. You you can't just sit on the sidelines and hope to get wealthy people. Why 30, though? I don't don't. Swing for the fences. Do 300. Yeah, 30 is 200. That'd be $2 million. That's not even enough to retire. Do 3,000. Just imagine. It's all just math. I love things like Safe Moon where math is in your favor. Thanks to Kenise for sending us that one. And you got a TikTok you want us to uh, talk about on the show? Send it to me, Joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Our second headline comes to us from Real Simple Magazine and is written by Lauren Phillips. Is it safe to use these buy now, pay later services like a firm after pay and Klarna? Are you familiar with these, OG? You seen these around? Uh, I am. Yep. I'm seeing them them all the time. What do you think about them? Well, should we explain to people what they are first? The uh, older people in the audience will remember these are much like layaway plans where you take something that you want, you can't afford it today, you hand it to them, and then you make these installment payments, and there were no additional fees. You could buy it a little bit at a time so you could afford it, and then you take it home. Well, the cool thing about these, you can take it home today. And you get a payment schedule from these third parties. And as long as you pay the minimum, in most cases, you pay zero fee and zero interest. The problem is, of course, if you miss a payment, the interest is absolutely hell to pay. Most of these companies, by the way, according to this real simple piece, and if you have our guide to the show, you've already been able to look through this. But if not, it'll be in our show notes page at stackingbedjamins.com as well. Most of these companies make the bulk of their money 
from other companies, not from the borrower. They actually make most of it from the merchant and go, hey, we can, we, we can take the risk here. If you just put this way to pay on your site, you can uh, make payments later and people can get their stuff today. Safe to use? Well, I mean, it's safe. It's not, you're not going to steal your information probably, but not a great idea to use. If you can't afford your Peloton bike in cash, I don't know why you should be financing it. <laughs> you know, it's uh, what was this a couple of years ago? We were talking about people Christmas shopping with it and like getting like sweaters and stuff like that. And like $12 a month for a sweater you yeah. know, for the next yeah. six months. And you can get the sweater. That's what I think just looking at this headline is that safety well, what safety are we talking about? Safe for you and your wallet? No, it's not safe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not probably likely to steal your information, but, but a terrible way to run your life. The, the thing about payments is that it's so deceptive and it's so sexy because you're like, Oh, well, what's a hundred dollars a month? Like who cares? That's hardly anything. You know, I can swing a hundred dollars a month. And then, and then you have another thing that's like a hundred dollars a month and you have a car payment that's like $400 a month. And then you have a student loan payment that's like $600 a month. And, and then you got a Peloton that's $300 a month. And all those little things, it's like the paper cut of death type of thing. I think there's a reason why when you look at stocks, one of uh, stock traders favorite metrics, favorite metrics. And the one that one Warren Buffett talks about all the time, right? Is free cash flow. Yeah. If you have free cash flow so that you can do things in the future without having to uh, worry about these commitments that are still a ghost of your past, I feel like you're doing the same horrible thing as a person by getting rid of your future cash flow. Right. Burn rates another another phrase that you'll hear people you like how much how much money do you use of the money that comes in, and then free cash flow would be the kind of next level of that, which is. How much of your cash that comes in has no obligations attached to it already? Yeah. We talk about budgeting. We talk about a spending plan and going, well, I want to give everything a, a purpose. It's going on right now in the housing market. Be, look at like housing prices are skyrocketing and the interest rates are still really low. So the affordability is there. You know, you can swing that $800,000 house purchase that last year was a $500,000 house purchase. But the bank will give me the loan. It's like the bank doesn't give a crap about your free cash flow. They want all of your money to go to them. That's what they want to have happen, actually. That's their goal. They don't want you to have extra. That's why they go, hey, you're approved for this loan. You're like, oh, my budget's $500,000. they are like, cool, you're approved for eight fifty. And that's why your realtor wants to know that. Because they don't care about your cash flow. They care about get, selling you an $800,000 house, not a $500,000 house. They make more money doing that. The co-founder of... Uh magnify of our sponsor magnify money nick remember when he was on the show and he used to work for credit card companies before he worked for magnify money i believe he worked for citigroup and for barclay and he said that they would solve for these these credit companies would solve for what is the maximum load a person can have without defaulting yeah like their goal was to use every bit of your credit and have you never default. If you default, they went a penny too far. Their goal was to get to find that bleeding edge with with you. They're they're not your friends. And you can see it on, you know, you look at your statement and it says, hey, if you make your minimum payment, it will take you 41 years. That's a new thing. That information was not on your statements 15 years ago. You know, maybe not even 10 years ago. Required by law now. A required thing, right? So if you make that $100 payment on your... $10,000 credit card bill it says you'll take 42 years to pay this off. If you make this payment, it'll take you three years. And this is how much interest you'll pay over that period of time. So if you can't pay for your stuff, just, just wait a little bit, just save money and then, and then write the check and have not have an obligation that's tied to it, especially consumer goods like Peloton bikes and sweaters. Yeah. I don't think the problem are these services. I mean, when you look at what people used to do, if you have horrible habits or you've been chased toward payday loans, well, this is certainly better than a payday loan. Uh, one of these companies, a firm, has interest that they charge, but there is no additional late fee. But part of me also thinks that some of these things that make it easier to get your hands on stuff with no late fee, not all these additional hidden fees. I mean, while on one hand, OG, that's consumer friendly, it's helping you buy stuff you can't afford. What's that phrase? Buying stuff you can't afford to impress people you don't know or care about? Yeah. It's fun to do that, but... 
I don't know. I just, you know, ever since we had organizational expert uh, Tracy McCubbin on, when she talked about, by and large, things that you buy depreciate in value, meaning you get all excited about buying it. And then the longer you own it, the less your brain loves it, takes it seriously. Yep. Doesn't have an impact after a while. Yeah. While on the other side, experiences appreciate in value. That trip that was pretty good when you went on it, five years later was epic, you know? experiences mm-hmm. up appreciate. So maybe if these were travel agencies that would let me travel and spend all my free cash flow on uh, trips wherever I want to go. Adventures by Disney takes a firm. <sighs> I I'd be in way over my head. <laughs> He'd be I'd, every every week. He's so far over my head. I'm over my head without that. Those trips are not cheap. But they were epic. Well in just a minute OG and I are going to jump off the saddle for a second, maybe pull up at the saloon OG and grab a beer from the saloon proprietor, talk about our big takeaways from today's headlines. But first, one big takeaway is that if you either have a military background, somebody in your immediate families in the military, or you have been in the military. You may not know that at Navy Federal Credit Union, they don't just serve the Navy. They also serve the Army, the Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, and even Space Force. No matter where you're at in your military career, they offer the products and the resources to help you navigate your finances. I've talked a lot about how much I like the resources at Navy Federal because there's so much stuff there that when you decide you want to dive into some of the educational stuff that they have, They ask you some pointed questions and say, hey, start with these. You're trying to get out of debt, trying to put children through college, trying to buy your first house. Whatever it is, Navy Federal has the education and then the resources to help you make it happen. Like the Navy Federal More Rewards American Express card that offers three times points at supermarkets, food delivery and gas, plus one point on everything else. So if you pay your credit cards off in full, find yourself out of debt. You're not spending that free cash flow as much as running the expenses, OG, through your credit cards that you were going to have anyway. You can enjoy special perks and points. You can redeem for cash, travel, gift cards, and more. Plus, earn bonus points. Learn more about how you can get 25,000 points at $250 value when you open a Navy Federal More Rewards American Express card today. Visit NavyFederal.org for more details and how to apply. That's NavyFederal.org. Insured by NCUA, American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license. All right, partner. It's a moment of truth. Deal them like you got them. (laughs) Deal them like you got them? (laughs) Boy. Is that a thing? Is that a phrase? Yeah, yeah, sure. It sure is. You ever hear, should we ask Annie Duke next time she's on if that's what they say in poker world? Deal them like you got them. Hey, Annie, deal them like you got them. My deal if like you got them is this. Create the commitment necessary to do the stuff that's on your task list or release yourself from the obligation. Pick one of those two things. Either get committed to doing it or take away the obligation. Either way, it gets off your list. That's what you got? Basically pocket aces. <laughs> Basically. I got a pair of twos, but I'm going to pretend here like it's a full house. Call me crazy, but save up for that thing you want. Practice a little delayed gratification. I think you'll like the thing more. You'll be able to afford it, which is going to make you sleep better at night than having to worry about how you're going to keep making payments for something that uh, fun you already had or stuff you already bought. Lisa Napoli is uh, one of my absolute favorite people. We interviewed her about Ray and Joan Kroc and about the founding of McDonald's and then Joan giving a lot of the money away. In fact, one place she gave a ton of money to was NPR. And if you followed Lisa Napoli's work, she follows stories that interest her. So she went from Ray and Joan took a little detour talking about the early days of CNN and how that got started and now is back following that Ray and Joan Kroc money to NPR and the four women she calls the founding mothers of NPR 
Let's hear the stories of Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki with our friend Lisa Napoli. And on her way down to the basement, here she comes. Lisa Napoli joins us again. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. It's nice to see you. Well, it's great to see you too. And I have to tell you with this book, you have me on every book. And I love speaking with you about Ray Kroc. That was such an interesting discussion. But on this one, you have me at Cokie Roberts. And I think, Lisa, I'm not alone. You probably have the... Doesn't the world just love Cokie Roberts? Yes, they do. Although it's funny that some people don't remember that Cokie Roberts actually worked full time and got her big launch at NPR. So it's a pleasure to be able to tell people about that. I'm so excited to share her story, what I know of it and what she hasn't already shared herself. Well, and not just her, but all four of these women are very brave. I think about my career and how I had people that look like me and sounded like me to look up to. And maybe in the early days, some we can talk about all four of these women, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki all had some mentors, but man, when they got to NPR, they were, there was really nobody was there. Well, part of it was that NPR was brand new out of the gate. Nobody knew if NPR was going to succeed. So everybody was just sort of scrambling to figure out not only their own role at National Public Radio, but also what the heck National Public Radio was going to be. And as importantly, how it was going to get onto the radios of the listeners, because that was not a foregone conclusion when it started. So it was a free for all. And that's why I love the story, because, as you know, I love my last book was about the early beginnings of CNN and the free for all that gave birth to that. It's not what it is today. Nothing like it. And it's the same thing with NPR and that these women emerged at the top of their career and at the simultaneously they made NPR into a household name. That's a cool story. Well, and not only a cool story, but also I'm wondering just as you're, as you're talking, because uh, Susan and Linda were there at the beginning, were Nina and Koki there at the very beginning? No, no, yeah, no, no. They think so. Yeah, they came early on, but uh, Susan and Linda happened to just, Linda actually was the first of the hires um, or among the first of the hires. And then Susan came a month later and that they were slightly different stages in their career. Susan had worked at WAMU, which now is a public radio powerhouse. But when she first got hired there, and she says this all the time, she was able to get hired there because she was low wage and a woman willing to work for for no money at a station that was untested it was a, it was a brand new station and Linda had been trying to make her way at CBS radio in New York but women were marginalized and not allowed to be on the air not allowed to aspire beyond being a researcher or maybe a reporter in the field, but not one whose voice would ever appear on the air. So she happened to get married and moved to Washington and happened to just sort of back end into this startup called National Public Radio. No one knew any idea, had any idea what it was going to become. So they both got hired at the beginning by a man named Bill Seemering who was the first person to hire folks, um, the staff at NPR after he got his job. And they literally were all trying to figure it out. And as such, they were able to sort of carve out roles for themselves in a way they would never have if they walked into NPR today, where they'd have a very distinct job assignment. So the cool thing is it provided a chance for women that didn't exist before. The tough thing is that it didn't exist before. So they had to all make it up, but that's often more fun than anything else. I think. Well, and it sounds like when you were writing about that period about Linda being hired, she almost didn't get hired because of her time at CBS. And I don't know if my brain uh, put this in there or if you wrote it, but was that because she sounded too much like the plasticky, same old, same old that you saw every day on CBS news? No, she never had a chance to speak on the radio because at that point, women were so – someone just posted a grid of the 1969 CBS radio schedule, and it was 
all white men except for Dear Abby. And they didn't even have a picture of Dear Abby. They just had her name, gossip columnist. But women were not allowed on the air in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, except on rare occasions and usually to cover women's news. So Linda couldn't even get a break on the air at CBS. Her impediment walking into NPR was that Bill Seemering, um, the sainted man known as founding father of NPR, didn't want a woman with a, an Ivy League degree. She went to a near Ivy League. She went to Wellesley College. And when she said to Bill Seemering, well, yeah, I went to Wellesley College and yeah, I worked in commercial radio, but uh, I went to Wellesley College on a scholarship and I'm a grocer's daughter from Carlsbad, New Mexico. That warmed Bill Seemering up. He was a pop populist before populist and inclusive before inclusivity was a thing. So, yeah. Yeah. I've, I have never thought that being a redneck from Southwest Michigan would work in my favor, Lisa. (laughs) Just maybe, maybe someday that'll work for me too. Work it, baby. Yeah, work it. (laughs) I was thinking as you were talking about these early days, not only were they able to help popularize uh, national public radio, but they really were able to set the tone in a lot of ways. And I'm wondering if this early network of setting the tone, if that was what really changed the tone for women, not just in radio, but in broadcasting in general? You could argue, and of course, there's no way to definitively know, but that's the whole idea of diversity and inclusion. If you see people on the air or hear people on the air or read their stories uh, and they're coming from a diversity of viewpoints, it indelibly will alter everything for both the, the consumer of the media and just for the medium itself. And so, yes, the idea that Linda had the ambition of becoming Edward R. Murrow's secretary, but then when she saw Pauline Frederick, who was a pioneering broadcaster of her day, and that allowed her to dream about being on the air. Next step of that is Linda being on the air, narrating the Panama Canal hearings in in Congress, first woman to do such a thing, indelibly informed NPR's listeners. At that point, they weren't in, in the numbers that they are now. It sort of taught people that women could have authority and they could speak about something that they'd never been speaking, had spoken about before in that public forum. So, of course, it's indelibly braided together. And that's what's so cool about this story, because you think of these women as synonymous with the network, but until I started researching it, it hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, they're synonymous with the network, but the network would never have arrived the way it did. And women's per- the perception of women changed so much just because their voices were allowed to deliver the news. So much. So. Absolutely so much. And it's interesting because, you know, we talk about women. You mentioned white men. And we put people into these boxes. But you can look at these four women And they're so damn different. Like they were so damn different. So let's dive in just a little bit to their early years. Susan was brought up uh, really listening to the radio. And I feel like from your storytelling that her listening to stories before the days of television really made her able to be a good storyteller in radio. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, she would definitely say that, too. And what I loved about Susan's story, and you're so right, they're so distinctly different. What I loved about Susan's story is that she came not from a fancy family. She came from a loving family who adored her and wanted her to do her very best in life. But they didn't come from big money or even big education. Her father was a salesman. Her mother you know, worked to help support the family, which was not common back then. It was something only women did when they needed to do. And so she did not come from affluence or wealth, but she came from this really nurturing environment in Manhattan. And because of that was able to, she went to a great public high school in New York City. And then from there, she went to public university before she got a scholarship to go to Barnard. And that really set the course of her life. I mean, who knows what would have happened to her if she'd stayed at Queens College, probably good things too, because she just had this dynamism about her from early, early on. But even before that, I mean, she went to a public high school, but she went to this high school that was not for her area. She went to a high school that was kind of a gifted and talented high school, right? Right, right. Today we'd call it that or a magnet school, but she got in because of her visual art skills into the high school of music and art, which was at that time 
you know, a rock star school still is. It's a different school, cast differently, merged with another. But it was an amazing opportunity for her to get out of the neighborhood, so to speak, and to go to school with a bunch of people. And this is another amazing lesson. If you hang around with ambitious, artistically minded people or people who are just desirous of more in their lives, whatever that, however that manifests itself, then that's going to rub off on you. And that's what happened to her. I love that her parents were kind of intimidated by her when she went to college. <laughs> like she was all of a sudden having conversations that mom and dad weren't that comfortable with anymore. Yeah, she is a classic example of her parents' parents were immigrants and they worked hard to make sure that it was better for the next generation. And that's exactly what happened, happened with Susan. And Linda's story couldn't be more different. Exactly. But similar in the sense that, again, it wasn't a fancy family. Uh, it was a hardworking family, ran the grocery in Carlsbad. Linda helped deliver the groceries she was an exceptional student and, you know, women were often good students, but were sort of tamped down with the expectation that that wasn't what was going to be your entire life. And she, Linda transcended that, you know, she again would have gone to an area school, an area college, but she got a scholarship that enabled her to, to dream about going to, to Wellesley. Someone said to her, if you want to make it as a journalist, you really need to go to the best possible school that you can. And that's what she did. And uh, again, you know, if she had gone to New Mexico state, that doesn't mean that she wouldn't have come out of it and done something formidable with her life. But uh, the fact that she got routed to the East Coast, to this rarefied environment, uh, which was intimidating for her at the beginning uh, and made the most of it, got, got an internship at the BBC at a time when that was incredibly unusual. She worked it. She worked it. And I'm wondering if, you know, we talked about them not having mentors later on, but I feel like Linda especially learned from a lot of people around her. I mean, her dad and, and mom, they became entrepreneurs when she was three years old, you wrote, and I think she has a very entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, Edward R. Murrow, well, he didn't tell her. He told the woman that you mentioned earlier that she could oh, never be anything, but she wanted to be Murrow's secretary and then said, I'm going to set my sights higher. Like, I feel like she had this great ability to learn from people around her and to adapt. Well, you know, I think that that's the undercurrent of all four women and of any successful person is that capacity to keep plowing forward, even in the face of adversity, whatever the adversity is. And I mean, you see that time and time again, you see it with Ray Kroc, you see it with Ted Turner, both born into completely different circumstances. And and with these four women, the, the through line, and they did support one another because they saw themselves in each other is that they really wanted it. And time and again, people said no. And time and again, they picked themselves up and just plowed through. And yes, they had a lot of lucky circumstantial breaks, not the least of which is that they arrived at this network at a time when it wasn't the ferociously competitive place that it has become. But nonetheless, they worked it, they managed it. And that really, I, I just find that lesson something over and over again you know, I love biography, reading biographies, writing biographies. And if there's any through line, that's typically the through line. When I first wrote to you about coming on and I was so pleased you wrote me back and said yes, but you also wrote that there's a lot of money stories here. You said there are a lot of money stories here with the birth of NPR. Tell me what you meant when you wrote that. Like what came immediately to your mind? Well, you know, NPR is a massive high dollar media property, not just because Joan Kroc left it all that loot back posthumously um, in 2004, but also because it's a huge engine like any media operation. It brings in hundreds of millions of dollars a year in advertising, which is not called that underwriting. They have you know, millions and millions of dollars of support from listeners who, who love it so much that they open their pocketbooks every year. And I think it's really interesting and important to talk about the economics of media. You know, we're taught that it's untoward to talk about the economics of public media because public media is higher purpose and all of that. But the truth is, it is it is an economic powerhouse. And what's interesting and what I thought when you first invited me to come on the show is that we, yes, we take it for granted. It's a huge economic powerhouse today. 
But we forget, or we maybe didn't even know, that it wasn't always that way. And the economics of the network and the network of stations that support it are weird, opaque. Weird is the wrong word. It's just not something that people understand. And I'm on this sort of crusade with these books that I'm writing to make sure that people understand not only the history of the media, but to understand the strange uh, relationships that people have with it to understand just how how it's all braided together, that the money is braided in with the culture of the place. So that's yeah. the top level of what I meant. And it's not as simple as we think it is. I, I mean, you hear these simplistic arguments about the media and it, it never is. Having worked at a television station for nine years, Lisa, I'll tell you it is not as simple as you think it is. It isn't. No. And that's what I think, especially with public radio, public broadcasting, if you as a a listener or viewer are giving money, I like when and I I pay attention to where I give my money and how that place I give my money spends it. And public radio gets a bad rap for being governmentally funded. Well, the truth is that the national public radio doesn't get the lion's share of the public financing. And there isn't a huge amount of that. That goes to the stations. And, you know, it's hard to extricate in a short conversation. But I just I wish that people would pay more attention to the fact that how public radio works financially, because I just think it's important to know where your money goes. That's not to say it's a nefarious situation, but it's just to say, pay attention to how it works. But the fact that it is a network and this series of stations that support it is something that wasn't out of the gate exactly how it works today, how it's laid out today. It morphed over time. Yeah. 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 Uh, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about Koki Roberts and you have your whole introduction is about Koki. How did Koki become the person that knew more about Washington than anyone else in the room, no matter what room she went into? She really is like, you know, you you read about Steven Spielberg. I remember when Steven Spielberg was becoming famous, they would always talk about how as a kid, he was obsessed with the movies And people who are obsessed with sports, you know, can quote scores and games from from 50 years ago that they didn't even see. And Koki was like that with politics, with the difference that she grew up with it. The reason it was baked into her was she grew up in a political family. So it was from gestation in her DNA that she understood and and loved politics. I guess you could grow up in that family and maybe trash it all and just go become a monk or something, but she didn't. She loved it so much and she had this ferocious adulation of the process. And that ferocious adulation of the process, which she saw both with her father as a congressman and then her mother succeeding her father when he died in a tragic accident, she saw the process and and loved the process so much and had this gift as people who love something don't always have of conveying it to the average person. So as she was coming up in the broadcasting world and, you know, she's this beautiful, accessible person, she's on television explaining it alongside a bunch of guys and she's explaining it in a no, no nonsense, accessible way that made people not only fall in love with her, but become political junkies. And that's what's such a cool part of her story. Is but, and also, that- but and also when she's there, and I, and I don't want to pass over this before we get too far, but when she's on with David Brinkley and she has this round table of all men. And uh, yeah. Sam Donaldson, I understand from your book, was the person that invited her on at first. And David Brinkley thought she was awesome. So number one, this idea of being evaluated by men to see if she was going to be awesome. But then she even defines, and she said this out loud, that she had to walk this tightrope, Lisa, that on one hand, you know, there are these words that we talk about with women that we never use with men, that she can be shrill or be mean. But on the other hand, she could be too meek. And she can't have enough of an opinion or defer too much. Where did she get that half of it, which was the speaking skills to be able to to negotiate that tightrope? You know, part of it, I think it's like that will that's baked into certain people. You, It's innate, whether you come from wealth, a privilege, or, you know, from a farm somewhere where so there's no think, opportunity. You don't think that's a learned thing that we can get ourselves. That's just cokey being cokey. Well, I think you can teach yourself to be a better speaker. And, you know, certainly people teach themselves to modulate on the air. 
But for her, it really, that's what was so magnificent, you know, in studying her family, both of her parents, because they're Southern, because they were born states people themselves, they had this demeanor. Just watching the interviews with her mother, she's an extraordinary person, as was her father, but her mother was exceptional. And I think that that genetic material and that nurture, watching that at the dinner table as a child, she said herself, Koki said herself, that she knew her place at the family dinner table where all these powerful men were frequently guests. Now, younger women, younger people will look at the story and will say, OK, that's bunk. You know, she had to sit there and and modulate herself on The Brinkley Show. But the truth is, at that moment in time that she was invited on The Brinkley Show was a moment in time that women were not typically talking about politics, government on the air or, or much of anything. So she knew that she had this access point. It's like my coming to your house the first time. I'm probably not going to take my shoes off right away. I like to take my shoes off in people's <laughs> houses. But you know what I'm saying? I yes. wouldn't walk into your house and sit down on the couch and put my feet up and say, here I am. I'm going to ease into that role. And she just had the poise and the demeanor. Um, she really was. I, I think it was Brinkley who said she was the total package. Sadly, part of the total package involved looking a certain way. I mean, she didn't look a certain way right out of the gate because she started out with her hair long. She called it gym teacher hair. So she got more quaffed and elegant. You know, part of getting older is easing into how you present yourself to the world as an older person. But that's the other thing I loved about all four of these women is that they have grown older before us and they've maintained their gravitas that seemed natural to them. And it's, I think it's a real, it's a different sort of role model than somebody who's an activist marching in the streets. That's terrific. Uh, the people do that, but they never felt the need to do that because they could do it. It was, it was sort of inherent in them, in their presentation of themselves to the world. That was part of it, their public face. Yeah, absolutely. The book is Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. I've absolutely loved digging into this, Lisa, and I'm assuming we can get it everywhere. Yes, you can. Anywhere you want, in any format you want. I read the ebook, uh, the audio book. Right. There is an ebook too. So is that fun? And gonna, oh, I love doing that. It's so much fun. And it really is a good way of editing your writing. It's also scary too, because by then it's all locked down. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I can read you the story if you want as well. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us and talking about really all of our roots that work in radio related stuff. Thank you for having me. I'm going to write another book so I can come back on your show. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm the meanest, baddest hombre of the old West, Joe's Mize neighbor, Doug. Sitting here around the campfire, I'll tell you right now that there's three things we'd like to do here in the great southwest as the sun goes down one we'd like to cheat at poker uh b we eat beans right out of the tin can and finally we toss around some amazing trivia questions now it was the gold rush and oil speculation that helped bring lots of settlers out here toward texarkana and points further on west which brings us to our gold rush question which United States president took us off the gold standard? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can go rustle up some cattle. Nah, nah, don't do that now. Be kind to your neighbors, partner. As you know, small businesses are still recovering from 2020 and looking for resources to rise to the challenge. And that's why Dell Technologies assembled an all-star lineup of podcasters to create a virtual conference to share advice and inspiration for small businesses. Whether you're still working remotely or back together again, let Dell Technologies help safeguard your business with modern devices and Windows 10 Pro. Search Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on radio.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts starting May 10th. People ask us all the time what our favorite podcasts are in the financial genre. And one that is always at the top of my list is talking real money with my friends, Don McDonald and Tom Cock. These two guys know money upside down. And even more than that, because we, we all know a money nerd that loves to talk about money, but doesn't really know how to do it in an artful way so that 
it's fun. You get it and you can use what you learn. Well, the reason they know and are so skilled at sharing financial advice is because Don was one of the first national financial talk show hosts, starting with business radio network in 1988. Tom is the former host of serious money on PBS and like stacking Benjamins. They know that it's more than education. It's actually about making sure that you're having a good time because you know, if mom ain't having fun, ain't nobody having fun. Isn't that right? That's the way it goes in my family way. It goes Seriously, here in the basement, just keep a mom entertained. Talking Real Money comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. There's over 600 episodes that you can binge. You can learn how to invest better, worry less, spend less in fees and commissions. And you can listen to it where you're listening to us now. So just hit pause. And the new term is follow, not subscribe. So if you're used to subscribing for shows, get used to following shows now. Follow them. Wherever you're listening to us now, or head to talkingrealmoney.com, or we'll also have a link on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Straightforward, honest advice on building the wealth you need for a more secure future. Don and Tom at Talking Real Money. Hey there, stackers. I'm the law on these here parts. Joe's my's neighbor, Doug. Joe's Ma's up cooking up some grub, so I reckon I best handle this here trivia question. We kept it simple today because of the heat and whatnot. We don't want you burning your brain or nothing. So let's get on back to that there trivia question, which was this. Which United States president took us off the gold standard? Well, cowpoke, back on June 5th, In the year of 1933, under the leadership of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the United States unhitched its little wagon from the gold standard, a monetary system in which currency is backed by gold. Congress enacted a joint resolution nullifying the right of creditors to demand payment in gold, making the greenback the law of the land. For that, the United States have been on the gold standard since 1879. Now that there is a year. Now if I if I know what's best for me, I'm going to ski-daddle and hit up my chores for my has my hide. Yeehaw! Big thanks to Lisa Napoli for hanging out. There are There are so many, many lessons, but I don't know. Did you ever watch uh, Cokie Roberts there, OG, in the early days with David Brinkley and sitting around the sitting around the table talking politics? And she was always, always seemed like the person who knew more about Washington than any of those people at the table. Uh, no, 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 (laughs) no, I'm not a not a politics show watcher. The career of Cokie Roberts just just interests me so much. Of course, Susan, Linda, and Nina also. And uh, didn't get much time to talk about Nina, but there's a ton in the book for people that want more. But the pathways for some of these these families, I mean, not only the struggles of being some of the first women OG doing what they do, but also in the case of Susan Stamberg, being the first person in her family to go to college to just be the first college educated person and blazing. I mean, there's so many trailblazing stories here, but I thought that was also interesting at that point, her parents not only can't help her, they're kind of intimidated by her. Your parents intimidated by you. Uh, no, my father still intimidates me. (laughs) He just makes sure. Yep. Just, just make sure you know, who's boss. Uh, thanks to Lisa for hanging out with us. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency put what you value first. I could go for a can of like uh, baked beans over an open fire. And I could go for sitting like way across the fire from you. <laughs> Not Don't going. you want to have a campfire? And I do. Put the can in there and 20 minutes later, it's bubbling. You get to find the hot dogs in there. That sound good. The little mini weenies. Yeah. Don't they come with the mini weenies in them? Isn't that how the cowboys did it? Yeah. What do you think these yeah. are? SpaghettiOs? Like the big bad cowboys in the old west? Isn't that where uh, 
Chef Boyardee got his start out on the range, feeding all the hungry cattle rustlers. You will want to some uh, spaghettios. <laughs> I, that's horrible. That's <laughs> terrible. I, I put it in a can. I can't. I, I can't do. I love. I love accents from around the world and around the United States, and I slaughter all of them. I just can't do any of them. Good day, mate. But it just dialects just just fascinate me. Uh, it's actually Haven Life uh, says they make things simple so that you can spend more time with your loved ones, probably eating more uh, Chef Boyardee. Frank and beans. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance simple. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. It is a simplified application, only ask the important questions. It's all online, so you get an instant coverage decision instead of these pages and pages and pages that other insurance companies have. Their prices are affordable, and of course, they're backed by a company that's more than 160 years old at Mass Mutual. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Stephen. Say hi, Stephen. Hey, Joe and OG. This is Stephen. I had a question about HSA investing, whether you guys thought I should be um, investing and then not touching the money, allowing compound interest to work, and paying for my medical expenses out of pocket. I do utilize my health care quite a bit, so I would spend the amount I put in every year. But I wanted your guys' take on it, or is this something I should be spending out of pocket and just allowing the money to grow in an investment account? Thanks a lot, guys. Hey, thanks for that uh, question, Stephen. And before we turn this over to you, OG, I just want to say we had a discussion about HSAs a couple of weeks ago on the show uh, for a roundtable. And the roundtable talked about how few people actually keep their receipts and how some people that have been on the show, uh, Belinda Rosenblum comes to mind immediately, who says to use it right away for the average person out there because of the fact that people don't keep their receipts. And immediately, some of our well-organized stackers thought, I was referring to the fact that people don't have a good system of keeping receipts. That's not actually the problem, OG. It's just that we don't do it. Like I think, I think sometimes our stackers that get an A plus on their money habits think that non-stackers just are two steps behind them. Guys, they're not two steps behind you. They're 50 steps behind you. Like just, just getting somebody to not use the credit card for every purchase is a huge first battle. So people start from different places. And, and while I love the fact that you sent me all kinds of cool technology and cool ways to keep your receipts, it's getting people to do it. That is actually the problem. So speaking to a large group of people, you know, like both people we talk to, you have to remember your whole audience. And that's the problem. OG is, is some people go, yeah, okay. I'm just going to pay for it out of pocket. And then later they're like, oh yeah, I never, uh, I never used that cool system. I had to keep my receipts. Yeah. And you got to remember if you're 25, that would be keeping that system in place for 40 years. Like the PC I have in my closet because there's a weekend when I have to figure out how to turn that thing on again, like that computer now is seriously old so I can get all the pictures out of it. Right. Yeah. So it's maybe easier said than done. I mean, if you can pay for it out of pocket and you can let the money invest. Yeah. I mean, obviously that's the better outcome in the long run. It's easily the better way. If you can do all those other things as well, if you can't and, or you can't do the compounding then the next best thing is to use it now because you get at least those out-of-pocket costs are, are going to be basically pre-tax. So it's a wonderful tool to use regardless of how you use it. You know, it's it's either really awesome or really, really awesome. Those are your two choices. So I don't think that you can go wrong with either of them. You know, I know plenty of people who don't have 7000 extra dollars a year to put in their HSA and then also have 7000 of out-of-pocket healthcare expenses. I mean, because then you're talking about you got to have $14,000 of extra money, you know? And many of us are just, like, happy that we've got enough money to pay for our out-of-pocket cost, period. And we don't have to owe the hospital money on top of all the other people we owe money to. So if you can do both and have a system for it, great. If you can't, there's no shame in that either. How great is it that you get to pay pre-tax for your healthcare expenses? We did get some, as I mentioned earlier, some great uh, help on how to 
track those receipts from stackers who are frankly just doing a great job. Mike was one person who wrote to me, said, great show, much improved over the years. I'm sure mom's proud. Even if she's not, at least you're not on the Xbox all day. (laughs) Very, very (laughs) nice. (laughs) Mike says, last week's debate at the time about HSA was great, but more innovation around the quote problem is needed to solve. It's too hard to track receipts. So again, Mike, it isn't about an innovative solution as much as people don't just don't do it. But like Mike said, we can give people some ways to do it. So here's here's what he does. He said, I have an older but still useful read is cheap multifunction printer scanner. I set the scan feature to scan direct to the folder on my computer that links to my cloud account with Microsoft. From that cloud folder, I share permission with my wife. So now she can get it to it easily if I kick the bucket early. Every time I have anything that applies to HSA, I throw it in the scanner and hit scan. Poof, receipt saved to the cloud. When I have a moment, I'll rename the file the dollar amount. This will allow future me to gather $842 of prior spending to fund those, quote, greatest show shirts for all my friends and family for the holidays. I know this sounds hard and not everyone wants to do even this low level of effort, but here's why I bother. Last year, my HSA went up in value about the same amount as the braces my kiddo needed. Yup, free braces. How's that for stacking Benjamins? Mike, that is a fantastic note. And to your point, OG, maybe people just don't see the don't see what's in it at the end, the rainbow, free yeah. flipping braces. Well, and that's, I mean, that could be said for any investment period over any time. It's like, you don't really see the value of investing $200 a month in your IRA because it's like, oh, I'm never getting anywhere. And then you just do it for 20 years and you're like, holy crap, I made $20,000 this year. That's That's a lot of money. So... It's not about, it's, it's, I don't know that it's the HSA in particular. It's just any savings in our investing program requires discipline and stick to But to Mike's point, he created a pretty easy system. Once he set it, like setting up that system was the hard part. Now it's just stick it in the printer and, and bam. I used to have, my, my scanner was a pain in the ass. And uh, Roger Whitney, and you have one of these scanners. Roger Whitney was the first one to turn me on to the snap scan printer. Yeah. And nothing could be better. It's the easiest thing on earth. Yep. It it just took something that used to take me all flipping day to do and made it easy. Roger was like, uh, welcome to 2014, Joe. <laughs> so thanks for the question. By the way, thanks for that help also, Mike. If you've got a question for us, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And you too can also receive for us for being brave and leaving a question, a greatest money show on earth. We're not just going to give one to Steven. Let's give one to Mike for uh let's not make him buy one. How about that? He helps out with the question and also gets some free swag. So now he can keep his 800 and something dollars Boom. or at least part of it. Now he's only got to buy nine for the other relatives. We'll send him one for free. Speaking of questions to the show coming up in a few weeks, we are going to begin performing the show live one day a week. And uh, it's going to start off as, as an experiment. If it works as well, OG, as we hope it works, we may be performing it live. So you can ask your questions. You can ask a question of our main guest, like Lisa Napoli, as an example. You can ask a live Haven Lifeline question. You can participate in the headlines. If you get the stacker, stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker, that's not only where you get the guide for today's show ahead of time, so you know what's coming up and some more resources on all the topics we talk about. But also, that's where we will first share where to get to the virtual, quote, auditorium for the live, live shows. Doing this thing live, people don't realize how often we stop in the middle of the show. Do, doing it live might be a little harder than, uh, than I think it's going to be. Thanks to everybody, by the way, also for their kind notes about the guide. I'm glad that people like it so much. We enjoy making it. We enjoy all the little extra things that we put in there. If you'd also like the guide to the shows, again, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker to get that. Lastly, if you're somebody that doesn't need that, you need better financial planning help in your corner. Remember what we talked about, about having a guide and, and avoiding procrastination. OG and his team can help you get where you want to go. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG 
If you need a better financial planning team in your corner and want to make better financial decisions in 2021 and beyond. All right, that's going to do it for today. I didn't talk about some of the awesome reviews. Big thanks to people who have left us a review too. I know I said that was the last thing, but this is actually the last, last thing. Little housekeeping here on the prairie, OG, in and out the show. All right, Doug, grab the team and hit the trail, my friend. What should we have learned in these here parts? So uh, what should we have learned there today, partner? First, take a lesson from our headline. Layaway programs? There ain't no gold in those hills, partner. At least not for you, anyways. There's lots of pitfalls and money for them companies. You'll just end up with a pile of stuff you ain't needing and can't afford no how. Second, take a lesson from that there Lisa Napoli. Even when there ain't no people who look or sound like you, there are always lessons you can draw to be a trailblazer and do what many people think is impossible. Hard to believe they thought women in radio was the impossible, but (laughs) times they are a-changing. But the big lesson? KK, so we can't exactly teach you how to speculate on gold, but who needs gold when you got Dogecoin? You don't even have to get your boots dirty for that. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more about Lisa Napoli and the extraordinary trailblazers of NPR, check out her new book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, the extraordinary story of the founding mothers of NPR, wherever books are sold. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter, at SBenjamin'sCast, or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm wondering if KY Jelly is actually made in Kentucky. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens here stays here. If you're here for money tips, if you're new to the show and you just discovered this uh, hidden track, we, we don't talk generally about money here. Every once in a while we do, but not today. Today we're going back to movie reviews because I'm trying to watch as many of the Academy Award nominees as possible. The awards were yesterday as you're listening to this. But as we record, we don't know who's going to win yet. So I made it, OG, through about half of them. And here's one that I just saw. This is a movie that was an Amazon original called The Sound of Metal. You sound great. Yeah, right. What? You're telling me you weren't feeling it? You were in it. We don't need to to put them all out. I know, but we have to kill them. Your hearing 
is deteriorating rapidly. We'll come back. Till then, Lou, we just keep going, okay? No. Lou, no. let's play tomorrow. Let's see what it's like, okay? I'm gonna be like a click track. You can play to me. You understand me? I can't. I'm deaf. I'm deaf. And this is the first of uh, quite a few tirades that uh, Ruben in the story has as he's coping with the fact that he's losing his hearing. And did you hear that part early on where it sounded like it was kind of underwater? You just heard the. The thing that this movie does, where some movies take you on uh, visual journeys, this takes you on an audio journey of him descending into, into uh, losing more and more of his hearing. And as the piece said, as the doctor's telling him, losing his hearing very, very, very quickly. So he's a drummer in a heavy metal band. He has this loud piercing noise that you heard uh, early on, just kind of thinks he needs to clear his ear. And then the next day he wakes up and he can't hear a thing. And everything sounds like it's underwater. And uh, after that, after he goes and has, has it checked, he tries many, many different things. And there's so many fantastic lessons in this film that just, I don't know, man, I don't want to give anything away that happens because it's so much this personal journey. It is not a fast movie. It is a slow movie, but it is a movie that, that you're with this guy the whole way the camera work is usually pretty up close and the camera follows him around. So it's not like a static cinematic scene. Scenes are very up close, making them very personal and you're feeling what he feels. And again, not to give it away, but the end of this movie, I could probably talk about for days, just, just what happens at the very end of the movie is such a fitting way to end a film that uh, I thought the sound of metal was, was, was great. I don't think it's my favorite though. I think that, for yesterday's award show, the father of the ones that I saw, the father was still my favorite. So I saw the father, Minari, which we haven't reviewed here yet, Sound of Metal. I think Sound of Metal second, Minari's third. I also saw Mank, as I mentioned before when we reviewed Mank. It was it was good. It was good. Not not my favorite movie. So Sound of Metal OG, I actually think you would really, really like this movie. I know there's nothing blowing up. But it's a heavy metal drummer living the rock and roll life. Okay, I'll put it on the list. It's it's just two hours of my life. I'll probably never get back, but... <laughs> Everyone I know that's seen this movie has really liked it. I would be surprised if you're the first to not like it. Sound of Metal on Amazon right now. <laughs> 